what a story. Well, we've, uh, we've, it's an amazing day. Thank you guys so much for being here this morning. It's uh, weathered the winter. I don't know. It seems like every time I preach these days, it snows. Set your clock, set your schedule. I don't know if Scott's preaching, just know that it's, it's about to snow, but it's great. Um, we've been, as a church, uh, the last four weeks, we've been in, a, in an amazing series with Andy Stanley called The Bible for Grownups. And if you were here for any or all of that, it was an absolutely amazing series, wasn't it? I mean, so inspiring, so in, empowering, enlightening. It's powerful to hear the story of the scriptures and how we came to have uh, a Bible in our hands. And, and again, it was an amazing series. Hopefully you enjoyed that. But if I could be honest for just a minute this morning, if I could be totally transparent with you. Personally, I hated that series. Um, and and I, I can admit that with, to you this morning. I hated it. The whole time I was watching it, I was uncomfortable. I remember sitting back there specifically last week and while we were watching it, I, I was regretting the decision that we made to show the series because I knew that I was speaking next. And so I knew that after four weeks of listening to Andy Stanley, I was going to be following him. And it's like, hashtag sucks to be me. So it's kind of here we all are this morning. And I'm, I'm glad you weathered it. But all joking aside, honestly, um, it was an amazing series. If you didn't see any of that, I would really encourage you to, go, to search that on YouTube. It, it's just an incredible series. And honestly, I am excited to be here with you this morning. I am excited to be able to share with you because as a church, we're in an amazing place. As I said, we've just spent four weeks talking about the story of how we got the story, that because of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done, what happened to Jesus specifically, and then because of his resurrection, because he rose from the dead, that event you know, birthed the movement, which, which launched the church. And now we have this amazing collection of writings and accounts of all that history that we can lean into with our lives. And over the last four weeks through this series with Andy Stanley, I've gained a new appreciation for this book that I so easily hold in my hands. And so we've been talking about that for the last four weeks. And then we have this two week series. And then we're only four weeks away after that. We're four weeks away from celebrating the resurrection of Jesus on Easter Sunday. So we're in just this really cool, amazing place as a church. And as we've been talking again, again about the story of how we got the story, I was reminded again of the power of stories. And we've said that as a church, we're going to continue to focus on being a storytelling church because stories are powerful. Stories are incredibly powerful in our lives. Stories fuel our faith. They fuel our hope. They fuel our belief. And one of the things that I took away from this series, and it's something I knew before, but I was just reminded of it again, that the stories that are found in scripture are not fairy tale stories. They're not fairy tales. They're actual accounts written by people who saw history in the making with their own eyes. And because of what they saw, they felt compelled to document it. And I'm personally so glad they did because as I look through the scriptures, I find that history and their stories help me live my story. That history and their stories help me live my story. And that when I open this book, I see memoirs of men and women who like me long for purpose. I find memoirs of men and women who in difficult times in their lives questioned God and they wondered where he was. I, I see people who struggled with having been betrayed. I find people who were trying to become better versions of themselves. And that through this series over the last four weeks, I've, I've gained a new appreciation for how we got the story. And we're about four, four to six weeks away from celebrating what happened that led to us getting the story. But this morning I find myself remembering why we have the story. And it's because history and their stories help me live my story because my life is in here. And I believe your life is in here. That, that if you wanna be a better man, a better woman, if you wanna be a better spouse, if you wanna be a better parent, if you wanna be a better boss, a better employee, if you wanna rid yourself of the stress that comes into your life because of finances and other things like that, if you wanna figure out what the purpose of all this is, your whole life is in here. I believe that. But maybe, maybe just maybe, you don't see it that way. Maybe you don't see it that way. Or maybe for some of you, you've lost sight of that. For others of you, you've just kind of lost sight of it. You've developed old eyes and you've been around it. You've been around it so long that you don't see it anymore. And you come to church week after week, no matter what's happening outside. You come to church week after week, but you haven't seen anything in a long time. Week after week, you find yourself in church but you haven't seen anything new. You haven't experienced anything new in your life in a long, long time. And it's not that you don't believe. Again, you come week after week, but it's just that you haven't experienced anything. You haven't seen anything new in a long time because let's be honest, at times your faith just becomes 
another routine in your life. That you get to the place in your journey where your faith isn't faith, it's just another routine, it's just another thing that you do. And so you find yourself just kind of getting old eyes and you've been around it for so long that you don't see it anymore. It's kind of like that mess in your house. You see it so much that you just don't see it anymore. And for others of you, that's why you're thinking about just walking away. For some of you, you did walk away. You find yourself back in church no matter what's happening outside. It's been a long time since you've been here. You're just kind of making your way back to church. And the reason that, that you walked away was because you didn't see anything happen. You didn't see anything happen in your life. You didn't see anything happen in the areas of your life that you desperately needed to see something happen. And you saw what the words on the page said and someone pointed out what the scripture says about your situation, about your circumstance, about your relationship. And you prayed and you might've even believed and and had hope, but nothing changed, nothing happened. And so you got to the place where you were in the same situation, you were going through the same circumstances and nothing was happening. There was no give, there was no hope in sight and so you just walked away. But for some reason or another, you find yourself back in church today or maybe that you're watching online. You find yourself desperately needing to see something new happen in your life. So wherever you are in your journey, no matter where you are in your journey, no matter what's happened in your past, I'm so glad that today, you're here because for today and next week, we're going to look into the memoirs of a man who, like us, desperately needed to see something new happen in his life. We're going to look at the memoirs of a man who, like us, desperately needed to see change happen in his life. But the only problem for him was he couldn't see at all. He was blind. That for the next two weeks, we're going to look into the memoirs of a blind man and we're going to discover a man who is stuck and has resigned himself to the fact that this is his life and this is how good and how great things are ever gonna be, that nothing is gonna change because nothing has changed and there's nothing I can see that ever could change. And so as we look into the memoirs of this blind man that are found in the book of Mark chapter 10, I want you to do two things with me, okay? Just two things for the next two weeks. Number one, in light of everything that we've heard through the series with Andy Stanley, I want you to the best of your ability to remember that this is not a fairy tale story that this is an eyewitness account of an encounter that Jesus had with a man who was blind. And the second thing I want you to do as best as you can, I want you to try to see yourself, pun intended, I want you to try to see yourself in his story. Now, before we jump into Mark chapter 10, let me give you just a little bit of context for this encounter that we're about to look at for the next two weeks. So, Uh, For any of you that are into maps, here we have Judea in the green here, Samaria, Judea, and Jesus is making his way to Jerusalem. Jesus is making his way to Jerusalem. He's headed with purpose to the cross. And we're about six weeks away from celebrating that event on Easter weekend, what happened in Jerusalem. We're almost there. We're six weeks away. And in this passage of scripture that we're about to look at, Jesus is about as equally far away from Jerusalem as we are to that moment in history today. And so Jesus is is started in Capernaum and he's making his way south through the region of, of, through Samaria and Judea. And he goes east of the Jordan River and he spends some time east of the Jordan River and he spends some time teaching there. And after he's done teaching, he continues on in his journey, making his way to Jerusalem. And on the way to Jerusalem, on the way with purpose towards Jerusalem, towards the cross, he comes to a place down here called Jericho. And when he gets to Jericho, he stops there for a brief visit. And it's where he stops that we're going to stop and stay for the next two weeks. And it says, then... Then they reached Jericho, and meaning they, meaning the disciples and Jesus. They reached Jericho, and as Jesus and his disciples left town, a large crowd followed him. Now, you've heard us say this over and over and over again, but this was commonplace for Jesus. He was continually surrounded by crowds. He was a rock star of his day. Everywhere he went, people followed. Everybody wanted a piece of the action. They wanted to see Jesus. They wanted to hear Jesus. They wanted to experience what everybody was talking about. So he was constantly surrounded by people. It says, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, was sitting beside the side of the road. So uh, again, for the next two weeks, I want us to look into the memoirs of this man, of this blind beggar. Now, Interestingly enough, I can't just call him the blind beggar. This isn't the story of the blind beggar because to use that kind of anonymity would say something about him that isn't true. Because any time in the Bible when you know, they use that kind of anonymity, it suggests that the person we're talking about isn't really that significant. But that's not the case here. Mark tells us that this man, his name is Bartimaeus. 
And not only that, he's the son of Timaeus. So, so this guy is someone. He's significant. Now, oftentimes in the scriptures, we don't know the people's names, right? I mean, there's other blind people, in fact, that Jesus encountered, and we don't know their names. There were lepers and people who were demon-possessed. We don't know their names. There was a woman at the well. She was the woman at the well. There was a woman that Jesus encountered that was caught in the act of adultery and her life was in jeopardy. We don't know her name. No names at all. But in this specific case, Mark tells us his name is Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus. It suggests this kind of aristocracy. It's kind of like he's someone, he's someone significant or better yet, he could have been. He could have been someone significant but he was blind. He was blind. Isn't it sad? Isn't it sad how sometimes your condition contradicts your position? Isn't it sad how sometimes your condition contradicts your position? You're a mom and your kids are, they're rebelling. Your home is a mess. It's falling apart. You might be the boss, but no one listens to you, let alone follows you. You might be educated, but you can't find a job. You're successful, but you're not satisfied. You can't find any kind of fulfillment. Sometimes your condition contradicts your position. Maybe you're a Christian and you're struggling. And because you're struggling as a Christian, you feel this kind of guilt that says, as a Christian, I shouldn't struggle the way I'm struggling. And so what's wrong with me? And you feel all this kind of guilt and you know what the scripture says and and you've prayed, but nothing happens, nothing changes. And so you feel this guilt, you feel this condemnation, this judgment that you put on yourself and you find yourself stuck. Sometimes your condition contradicts your position. And when you get to that place, you find yourself stuck, you're drained you're demoralized, and you're left with just a bunch of unanswered questions. And though you might be able to see with your eyes, you can't see how things could ever be any different. You can't see how things could ever be any better. And here's Bartimaeus, and he's just sitting on the side of the road as a blind man. He's sitting while the traffic, while people, while while life passes him by where life just passes him by and he's, he's unable to engage in it, but he's close enough to hear it, but he's not physically able to participate in it. So he gets close enough, he gets near enough, he gets close to it and he just survives in a society that ignores the afflicted. And it's not like today. I mean, you get something wrong with you today, you can just run over to shoppers over here or you can, you can go into the grocery store, into the pharmacy section and you can get some medicine. You can get into a doctor and you might wait a while, but you get to the doctor or you, you, know, you get something for what ails you. But in those days, if there was something wrong with you, oftentimes you were just out of luck because there wasn't a pharmacy on the corner that you could run to. There were no ERs, there were no doctors, and if they were, they weren't accessible to everybody. In those days, in the days of Bartimaeus, if there was something wrong with you, oftentimes you were just out of luck. And what do you do when you get to the place in your life where it feels like your luck is running out? Have you ever been there? Have you ever ever been to that place in your life where it just seems like I can't take anymore and my luck has run out? What do you do? Or what do people who have something wrong that cannot be fixed do? What do people who have something wrong that cannot be fixed do? What do they do? They congregate with other people who have something wrong that they can't fix, right? I mean, they develop this kind of fraternity in their misery and people gather and they congregate together with other people who are just as, you know, in a bad place or going through just as difficult time. And they kind of congregate and they're defined by their pain, and they try to make the best of a bad situation. And that's where Bartimaeus is. He's gotten to the place where he's just learned how to survive. He's learned how to survive, like many of us at times, he's learned how to survive with a condition that he can't fix. He's learned how to survive with a condition that he can't change. What do you do when there's something wrong and you can't fix it? What do you do when there's something wrong and you can't fix it? I'll be honest, I'll tell you what I do. I just throw it out. I I mean, I'm being totally honest with you. I'm not patient. I'm not one of those people who has a gift of of being able to fix things. If there's something wrong at home, if there's something wrong in our house, there's something broke and I can't fix it quickly or easily, I just throw it out and I go get a new one. 
Some of you are really good at fixing things. That's not Scott. I just throw it out and go get a new one. But what do you do? What do you do when there's something wrong and you can't fix it? What do you do when there's something wrong and you can't fix it? What do you do when there's something wrong with you? What do you do when there's something wrong in you and you can't fix it? What do you do when there's something wrong and you can't fix it so you go to someone for help and they can't fix it? Worse yet, worse yet, what do you do when there's something wrong and you can't fix it so you, you go to someone for help and rather than helping you, they actually make things worse? What do you do when you have something wrong that you can't fix and you go to someone for help to, for them to fix it, but they have a problem that's just as bad or if not worse than yours and things just get even worse? What do you do? I'll tell you what Bartimaeus did. It's what many of us do, even though we can't see it. You have to listen to the language of the text. He was just sitting by the side of the road, sitting beside the road. He's sitting where everyone else is moving, where everyone else is just passing him by. Have you ever felt like people are just passing you by? Have you ever felt so stuck in your situation, in your circumstance, in your reality that it just seems and feels like people are just passing you by? I mean, if I'm gonna be stuck here and everybody's gonna be moving around me, everybody's gonna be doing things around me, but I'm gonna be stuck here broke, I don't wanna watch, right? I mean, if, if, if things are happening around me, if, if everybody's happy around me, I don't wanna be around them because I'm sad and it makes me sadder to be around their happiness. I don't even want to come to church when you're singing, oh, he's a good, good father. He's a good, good father. And my situation tells me, I'm not even sure if I believe in him anymore. I mean, it's a painful place you find yourself in when you're surrounded by people who are doing something that you can't do, right? When you're surrounded by people and you're so stuck that it just seems like life, their life and your life is just passing you by and you're stuck. That's where Bartimaeus is. And the truth is you and I, we can have situations, we can have circumstances, we can have things that happen to our lives that leave us stuck on the side of the road. And let's be honest, the torment, the torment isn't even the condition itself, is it? In fact, the torment is more than the condition itself. The torment is watching other people moving on, going on, building a life, building a marriage, building a family, building a career, and you're stuck sitting on the side of the road while life is just passing you by. And any time that you have a situation in your life, any time you have a problem in your life that you can't fix, any time you have a problem in your life that you, your, your husband can't fix or your wife can't fix, any time you have a problem that your friends can't fix, any time you have that kind of problem in your life that can't be fixed, you develop a way, you develop a system to survive in that environment that you can't fix or that you can't change. And that's what Bartimaeus has done. Bartimaeus has created a culture in his life to help him endure a reality in his life that he can't fix or he can't change. As a beggar, we would know that he would have a coat. He'd have a coat around his shoulders to comfort him because he was gonna be there for a long time. He's got that coat over his shoulders and he's thinking, I just... I just need to comfort myself. I'm going to be here. This is my life. This is as good as things are going to be. So I have a coat to comfort me. And he has a cup. Probably thought I had some coffee in there, but he has a cup. He has a coat and a cup. And the cup was what he used to beg with. A coat to comfort him and a cup for contributions. The cup was what people in those days did, the people who couldn't work the people who couldn't get up, the people who couldn't get, get on, couldn't go forward. So he's got a coat to comfort himself with and a cup for contributions and he hopes, he just sits and hopes and waits, hoping that people will put something, something, anything in his cup. He just sits and waits on contributions. This is my life. This is who I am. This is what I am and it's never gonna be anything more. So I've got a coat around my shoulders to comfort me, to comfort what I can't change, to comfort what I can't cure, and I have a cup. It's a means of survival. It's, it's, it's the system that I've built around myself to help me survive and deal with what I can't change in my life. I've got a coat for comfort and a cup for contributions, and he waits, and he waits, 
hoping that someone will put something, something, anything in his cup. So he's got a cup and a coat. He's got a cup and a coat. He walks around, he sits and he waits and he waits and he's blind and he hears the traffic pass him by. And the sounds that he hears just creates more agony in his heart and in his spirit, but he's created this culture. He's created this system, this way of survival. And I have a coat because I'm gonna be here. I have a coat because I need to be comforted. I have a coat because I need to stay warm because this is what my life is and I have a cup. It's everything that I have to help me survive, to help me endure what I can't fix or what I can't change. And hopefully people will help contribute to my survival. I am a blind man and this is my life. It will never be more. I can't see and I can't see how things could ever change in my life. I have a cup and I have a coat. Now, let's be honest this morning. Most of us, if not all of us, are not blind like Bartimaeus. Many of us, if not all of us, are not even blind like the young astronomer that we saw on the video this morning. But every single one of us in this room this morning and every single one of you watching online, every single one of us has experienced blindness in our life, right? Every single one of us knows what it's like to have a blind spot in our lives. Many of you know that when you drive, right? I mean, have you ever had you know, a car come out of nowhere and it almost hit you, wrecked your car because they were in your blind spot? Right? I mean, it's amazing what a blind spot can do in your life. And if you don't take precautions, if you don't make adjustments to the mirror, you could wreck your whole car over what you can't see. And every single one of us in here this morning has blind spots in our lives, those things that we can't see. And though you might be successful, though you might be intelligent, and though you may be able to be and do a lot of things, all those things you can do and all those things you are don't help you in your life if you have a blind spot. A blind spot, all of us have them where something can come out of nowhere and hit you and it can take you down and it can knock you out. It's like, whoa, I didn't even see that coming. And it just leaves you stuck and leaves you in a wake of destruction and your reality is something that seems so incredibly difficult to get out of. And that's where Bartimaeus is. And yet you have all these people in your life who look at you and they celebrate something about your life or something that you're able to do in your life. And they think you're this great and wonderful, successful person and they have no idea that you go home and cry at night, not over what you can do, but what you can't do, right? You go home at night and you focus not on the things that you can do, you focus on that thing that you can't do, that thing that you can't fix, that thing you can't change, that thing that you are never able to figure out in your life, who you're unable to have in your life your blindness in your life. That's where Bartimaeus is. And you can't imagine how things could ever be any different in your life. And so here's Bartimaeus with a coat to comfort him and a, and a cup in his hand. And he's just waiting, waiting. Not waiting for things to change. Just waiting for more of the same because his life has not become about living. It's become a life of endurance and surviving what he can't change. And you may be there this morning. You may be in that place this morning where you can't imagine how your marriage could ever be any better or any different. You're struggling with an addiction in your life and you can't imagine you could ever get to a place where you could have freedom in your life. The bills keep coming and the money has run out and you can't imagine getting to a place in your life where you weren't just down and out with stress over your finances. Your kids are rebelling or you don't know how to deal with your kids and you can't imagine or see a way that things are ever gonna be any better. Your work environment is what it is and you, even though you're educated, you can't seem to make your, make your way up the corporate ladder and you've resigned yourself. This is how good my life is ever gonna be. You're sitting on the side of the road and life is just passing you by. And here's Bartimaeus with his cup in his hand. Alms, alms, just waiting. And every once in a while, people will pass him by and drop something in his cup, none of which fixes his situation, none of which removes his situation or the pain that he's experiencing because of his situation. And even though he can't see in his cup, he knows that what's in his cup isn't for his 
healing. It's for his survival. It's as if Bartimaeus would say, you know, I, even though I can't see what's in my cup, I, 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 I know that you can see, he would probably say. You can see all the false promises and the false hope. You can see all the false friendships and the, the pipe dreams and the, the phony ideas. You can see how people have contributed to my survival, but nothing has contributed to my healing. It's as if he's sitting there saying to people, look, I know you can't heal me. I know you can't change my situation, but you, will you just help me endure it? Will you help me survive it? Will you help me survive this situation that I just can't change or can't imagine ever being any better? It's as if people are contributing to his dysfunction. Maybe you've experienced that where people have given you all kinds of advice, none of which has helped you. You've read all kinds of books, none of which have fixed you. You've prayed all kinds of prayers, none of which have healed you or taken that issue in your life away or made it any better. And you find yourself stuck on the side of the road just waiting, not to live a better life, just to survive the one that you're in. Bartimaeus was a blind man and he had a coat over his shoulders and a cup in his hand, that's who he was and that's all that he had until one day, until one day. He had a coat over his shoulders and a cup in his hand. That's who he was and all he had until one day. Now, it would be really easy for me this morning to just put this story in a box and wrap it up and put a bow on it and send you on your way. But I don't want to do that this morning. In fact, I want to do the exact opposite. I want us just to sit on the side of the road with Bartimaeus. For the next seven days, rather than me just wrapping this whole thing up and sending you on your way back out into the weather, I want us just to, just to sit on the side of the road with Bartimaeus for the next seven days. And, and what I'm going to invite you to do is something that we don't normally do around here. I'm just going to kind of leave this and walk away from it. And I'm going to invite you to do something with me over the next seven days. What I'd like you to do is open a Bible. Open a Bible to the book of Mark chapter 10, verse 46 through 52. I want you to open the Bible to the memoirs of blind Bartimaeus. And for the next seven days, I want you to read those six verses once a day. It'll take you about five minutes. You can do it really quickly, really easily. But over the next seven days, every day for the next seven days, I want you to read Mark chapter 10, verse 46 through 52. And I want you to do something as you read it. I don't want you just to simply read it, okay? I want you to read it. And then I want you to try to see yourself in his story. I want you to try to, you to put yourself in his sandals. I don't want you to, you know, try to assume his blindness. What I want you to do over the next seven days as you read this day after day, I want you to realize your own blindness, and as you do that over the next seven days, I want you to ask yourself one simple question between now and next Sunday when we all come back and continue on in the memoirs of this blind man. I want you to ask yourself a simple question. What would it look like? What would it look like for what happened to him to happen to you? What would it look like for what happened to him to happen to you? And we'll pick up the memoirs of blind Bartimaeus and continue on next week.